The Return of the King, Disc 13. One. Concerning Hobbits. This book is largely concerned with Hobbits, and from its pages a reader may discover much of their character and a little of their history. Further information will also be found in the selection from the Red Book of Westmarch that has already been published under the title of The Hobbit. That story was derived from the earlier chapters of the Red Book, composed by Bilbo himself, the first hobbit to become famous in the world at large, and called by him there and back again, since they told of his journey into the east and his return an adventure which later involved all the hobbits and the great events of that age that are here related. Many, however, may wish to know more about this remarkable people from the outset, while some may not possess the earlier book. For such readers, a few notes on the more important points are here collected from Hobbit lore, and the first adventure is briefly recalled. Hobbits are an unobtrusive but very ancient people, more numerous formerly than they are today, for they love peace and quiet and good-tilled earth. A well-ordered and well-farmed countryside was their favourite haunt. They do not and did not understand or like machines more complicated than a forge bellows, a water mill or a hand loom, though they were skilful with tools. Even in ancient days they were, as a rule, shy of the big folk, as they call us, and now they avoid us with dismay and are becoming hard to find. They are quick of hearing and sharp-eyed, and though they are inclined to be fat and do not hurry unnecessarily, they are none the less nimble and deft in their movements. They possessed from the first the art of disappearing swiftly and silently, when large folk whom they do not wish to meet, come blundering by. And this art they have developed until to men it may seem magical. But hobbits have never, in fact, studied magic of any kind, and their elusiveness is due solely to a professional skill that heredity and practice, and a close friendship with the earth, have rendered inimitable by bigger and clumsier races. For they are a little people, smaller than dwarves, less stout and stocky, that is, even when they are not actually much shorter. Their height is variable, ranging from between two and four feet of our measure. They seldom now reach three feet, but they have dwindled, they say, and in ancient days they were taller. According to the Red Book, Bandobras Tuk, Bullroarer, son of Isengrim the Second, was four foot five and able to ride a horse. He was surpassed in all Hobbit records only by two famous characters of old, but that curious matter is dealt with in this book. As for the Hobbits of the Shire, with whom these tales are concerned, in the days of their peace and prosperity they were a merry folk. They dressed in bright colours, being notably fond of yellow and green, but they seldom wore shoes, since their feet had tough, leathery soles and were clad in a thick, curling hair, much like the hair of their heads, which was commonly brown. Thus the only craft little practised among them was shoemaking, for they had long and skilful fingers and could make many other useful and comely things. Their faces were as a rule good-natured rather than beautiful, broad, bright-eyed, red-cheeked, with mouths apt to laughter and to eating and drinking. And laugh they did, and eat, and drink, often and heartily, being fond of simple jests at all times, and of six meals a day when they could get them. They were hospitable and delighted in parties and in presents which they gave away freely and eagerly accepted. It is plain indeed that in spite of later estrangement hobbits are relatives of ours, far nearer to us than elves or even than dwarves. Of old they spoke the languages of men after their own fashion, and liked and disliked much the same things as men did. But what exactly our relationship is can no longer be discovered. 
the beginning of hobbits lies far back in the elder days that are now lost and forgotten. Only the elves still preserve any records of that vanished time, and their traditions are concerned almost entirely with their own history, in which men appear seldom and hobbits are not mentioned at all. Yet it is clear that hobbits had, in fact, lived quietly in Middle-earth for many long years before other folk became even aware of them. And the world, being after all full of strange creatures beyond count, these little people seemed of very little importance. But in the days of Bilbo and of Frodo his heir, they suddenly became, by no wish of their own, both important and renowned, and troubled the counsels of the wise and the great. Those days, the third age of Middle-earth, are now long past, and the shape of all lands has been changed, but the regions in which hobbits then lived were doubtless the same as those in which they still linger, the northwest of the old world, east of the sea. Of their original home the hobbits in Bilbo's time preserved no knowledge. A love of learning, other than genealogical lore, was far from general among them but there remained still a few in the older families who studied their own books, and even gathered reports of old times and distant lands from elves, dwarves, and men. Their own records began only after the settlement of the Shire, and their most ancient legends hardly looked further back than their wandering days. It is clear, nonetheless, from these legends, and from the evidence of their peculiar words and customs, that, like many other folk, Hobbits had in the distant past moved westward. Their earliest tales seemed to glimpse a time when they dwelt in the upper vales of Anduin, between the eaves of Greenwood the Great and the Misty Mountains. Why they later undertook the hard and perilous crossing of the mountains into Eriador is no longer certain. Their own accounts speak of the multiplying of men in the land, and of a shadow that fell on the forest, so that it became darkened, and its new name was Mirkwood. Before the crossing of the mountains, the hobbits had already become divided into three somewhat different breeds, Harfoots, Stoors, and Fallowhides. The Harfoots were browner of skin, smaller and shorter, and they were beardless and bootless. Their hands and feet were neat and nimble, and they preferred highlands and hillsides. The Stoors were broader, heavier in build, their feet and hands were larger, and they preferred flat lands and riversides. The fallow hides were fairer of skin and also of hair, and they were taller and slimmer than the others. They were lovers of trees and of woodlands. The Harfoots had much to do with dwarves in ancient times, and long lived in the foothills of the mountains. They moved westward early, and roamed over Eriador, as far as Weathertop, while the others were still in Wilderland. They were the most normal and representative variety of Hobbit, and far the most numerous. They were the most inclined to settle in one place, and longest preserved their ancestral habit of living in tunnels and homes. The Stoors lingered long by the banks of the great river Anduin, and were less shy of men. They came west after the Harfoots, and followed the course of the Loudwater southwards. And there many of them long dwelt between Tharbad and the borders of Dunland, before they moved north again. The Fallowhides, the least numerous, were a northerly branch. They were more friendly with elves than the other hobbits were, and had more skill in language and song than in handicrafts, and of old they preferred hunting to tilling. They crossed the mountains north of Rivendell and came down the river Horwell. In Eriador they soon mingled with the other kinds that had preceded them, but being somewhat bolder and more adventurous, they were often found as leaders or chieftains among clans of Harfoots or Stores. Even in Bilbo's time the strong fellow Hydish strain could still be noted among the greater families, such as the Tooks and the Masters of Buckland. In the westlands of Eriador, between the misty mountains and the mountains of Loon, the hobbits found both men and elves. Indeed, a remnant still dwelt there of the Dúnedain. 
the kings of men that came over the sea out of westerness. But they were dwindling fast, and the lands of their north kingdom were falling far and wide into waste. There was room and to spare for incomers, and ere long the hobbits began to settle in ordered communities. Most of their earlier settlements had long disappeared and had been forgotten in Bilbo's time. But one of the first to become important still endured, though reduced in size. This was at Bree, and in the Chetwood that lay round about, some forty miles east of the Shire. It was in these early days, doubtless, that the hobbits learned their letters and began to write after the matter of the Dunedain, who had in their turn long before learned the art from the elves. And in those days also they forgot whatever languages they had used before, and spoke ever after the common speech, the Westron, as it was named, that was current through all the lands of the kings from Arnor to Gondor, and about all the coasts of the sea from Belfalas to Loon. Yet they kept a few words of their own, as well as their own names of months and days, and a great store of personal names out of the past. About this time, legend among the hobbits first becomes history with a reckoning of years, for it was in the one thousand six hundred and first year of the Third Age that the Fallowhide brothers, Marco and Blanco, set out from Bree, and having obtained permission from the High King at Fornost, they crossed the brown river Baranduin with a great following of hobbits. They passed over the bridge of Stonebows that had been built in the days of the power of the North Kingdom, and they took all the land beyond to dwell in between the river and the far downs. All that was demanded of them was that they should keep the great bridge in repair, and all other bridges and roads, speed the king's messengers, and acknowledge his lordship. Thus began the Shire Reckoning, for the year of the crossing of the Brandywine, as the hobbits turned the name, became year one of the Shire, and all later dates were reckoned from it. At once the western hobbits fell in love with their new land, and they remained there, and soon passed once more out of the history of men and of elves. While there was still a king, they were in name his subjects, but they were, in fact, ruled by their own chieftains, and meddled not at all with events in the world outside. To the last battle of Fornost, with the witch-lord of Angmar, they sent some bowmen to the aid of the king, or so they maintained, though no tales of men record it. But in that war the North Kingdom ended, and then the hobbits took the land for their own, and they chose from their own chiefs a thane to hold the authority of the king that was gone. There for a thousand years they were little troubled by wars, and they prospered and multiplied after the dark plague, Shire Reckoning 37, until the disaster of the long winter and the famine that followed it. Many thousands then perished, but the days of dearth, 1158 to 1160, were at the time of this tale long past, and the hobbits had again become accustomed to plenty. The land was rich and kindly, and though it had long been deserted when they entered it, it had before been well tilled, and there the king had once had many farms, cornlands, vineyards, and woods. Forty leagues it stretched, from the far downs to the Brandywine Bridge, and fifty from the northern moors to the marshes in the south. The hobbits named it the Shire, as the region of the authority of their thane, and a district of well-ordered business. And there, in that pleasant corner of the world, they plied their well-ordered business of living, and they heeded less and less the world outside where dark things moved, until they came to think that peace and plenty were the rule in Middle-earth, and the right of all sensible folk. They forgot or ignored what little they had ever known of the guardians, and of the labours of those that made possible the long peace of the Shah. They were, in fact, sheltered, but they had ceased to remember it. At no time had hobbits of any kind been warlike, and they had never fought among themselves. In olden days they had, of course, been often obliged to fight to maintain themselves in a hard world, but in Bilbo's time that was very ancient history. 
the last battle before this story opens, and indeed the only one that had ever been fought within the borders of the Shire, was beyond living memory. The Battle of Greenfields, Shire Reckoning 1147, in which Bandobras took, routed an invasion of orcs. Even the weathers had grown milder, and the wolves that had once come ravening out of the north in bitter white winters were now only a grandfather's tale. So, though there was still some store of weapons in the Shire, these were used mostly as trophies, hanging above hearths or on walls, or gathered into the museum at Mickledelving. The Matham House, it was called, for anything that hobbits had no immediate use for, but were unwilling to throw away, they called a Matham. Their dwellings were apt to become rather crowded with Mathams, and many of the presents that passed from hand to hand were of that sort. Nonetheless, ease and peace had left this people still curiously tough. They were, if it came to it, difficult to daunt or to kill, and they were, perhaps, so unwearyingly fond of good things, not least because they could, when put to it, do without them, and could survive rough handling by grief, foe, or weather, in a way that astonished those who did not know them well, and looked no further than their bellies and their well-fed faces. Though slow to quarrel, and for sport killing nothing that lived, they were doughty at bay, and at need could still handle arms. They shot well with a bow, for they were keen-eyed and sure at the mark. Not only with bows and arrows, if any hobbit stooped for a stone, it was well to get quickly under cover, as all trespassing beasts knew very well. All hobbits had originally lived in holes in the ground, or so they believed, and in such dwellings they still felt most at home. But in the course of time they had been obliged to adopt other forms of abode. Actually in the Shire in Bilbo's days it was, as a rule, only the richest and the poorest hobbits that maintained the old custom. The poorest went on living in burrows of the most primitive kind, mere holes indeed, with only one window or none, while the well-to-do still constructed more luxurious versions of the simple diggings of old. But suitable sites for these large and ramifying tunnels, or smiles as they called them, were not everywhere to be found. And in the flats and the low-lying districts the hobbits, as they multiplied, began to build above ground. Indeed, even in the hilly regions and the older villages, such as Hobbiton or Tuckborough, or in the chief township of the Shire, Mickle Delving on the White Downs, there were now many houses of wood, brick, or stone. These were specially favoured by millers, smiths, ropers, and cartwrights, and others of that sort, for even when they had holes to live in, hobbits had long been accustomed to build sheds and workshops. The habit of building farmhouses and barns was said to have begun among the inhabitants of the marish down by the Brandywine. The hobbits of that quarter, the East Farthing were rather large and heavy-legged, and they wore dwarf boots in muddy weather. But they were well known to be stores in a large part of their blood, as indeed was shown by the down that many grew on their chins. No half-foot or fallow-hide had any trace of a beard. Indeed, the folk of the Marish and of Buckland, east of the river, which they afterwards occupied, came for the most part later into the Shire up from Southaway and they still had many peculiar names and strange words not found elsewhere in the Shire. It is probable that the craft of building, as many other crafts beside, was derived from the Dúnedain. But the hobbits may have learned it direct from the elves, the teachers of men in their youth. For the elves of the high kindred had not yet forsaken Middle-earth, and they dwelt still at that time at the grey havens away to the west, and in other places within reach of the Shire. Three elf-towers of immemorial age were still to be seen on the tower hills beyond the western marches. They shone far off in the moonlight. The tallest was furthest away, standing alone upon a green mound. The hobbits of the west farthing said that one could see the sea from the top of that tower, 
but no hobbit had ever been known to climb it. Indeed, few hobbits had ever seen or sailed upon the sea, and fewer still had ever returned to report it. Most hobbits regarded even rivers and small boats with deep misgivings, and not many of them could swim. And as the days of the Shire lengthened, they spoke less and less with the elves, and grew afraid of them, and distrustful of those that had dealings with them. And the sea became a word of fear among them, and a token of death, and they turned their faces away from the hills in the west. The craft of building may have come from elves or men, but the hobbits used it in their own fashion. They did not go in for towers. Their houses were usually long, low, and comfortable. The oldest kind were, indeed, no more than built imitations of smiles, thatched with dry grass or straw, or roofed with turves, and having walls somewhat bulged. That stage, however, belonged to the early days of the Shire, and hobbit building had long since been altered, improved by devices, learned from dwarves, or discovered by themselves a preference for round windows and even round doors was the chief remaining peculiarity of Hobbit architecture. The houses and the holes of Shire Hobbits were often large and inhabited by large families. Bilbo and Frodo Baggins were as bachelors very exceptional, as they were also in many other ways, such as their friendship with elves. Sometimes, as in the case of the Tooks of Great Smiles, or the brandy bucks of Brandy Hall, many generations of relatives lived in comparative peace together in one ancestral and many tunnelled mansion. All hobbits were, in any case, clannish and reckoned up their relationships with great care. They drew long and elaborate family trees with innumerable branches. In dealing with hobbits, it is important to remember who is related to whom and in what degree. It would be impossible in this book to set out a family tree that included even the more important members of the more important families at the time which these tales tell of. The genealogical trees at the end of the Red Book of Westmarch are a small book in themselves, and all but hobbits would find them exceedingly dull. Hobbits delighted in such things if they were accurate. They liked to have books filled with things that they already knew set out fair and square with no contradictions. 2. Concerning Pipeweed There is another thing about the hobbits of old that must be mentioned an astonishing habit. They imbibed or inhaled, through pipes of clay or wood, the smoke of the burning leaves of a herb, which they called pipeweed or leaf a variety, probably, of Nicotiana. A great deal of mystery surrounds the origin of this peculiar custom, or art, as the hobbits preferred to call it. All that could be discovered about it in antiquity was put together by Meriadoc Brandybuck, later master of Buckland, and since he and the tobacco of the South Farthing play a part in the history that follows, his remarks in the introduction to his Herb Lore of the Shire may be quoted. This he says, is the one art that we can certainly claim to be our own invention. When hobbits first began to smoke is not known. All the legends and family histories take it for granted. For ages folk in the Shire smoked various herbs, some fouler, some sweeter. But all accounts agree that Tob Old Hornblower of Longbottom in the South Farthing first grew the true pipe weed in his gardens in the days of Isengrim the second, about the year 1070 of Shire Reckoning. The best homegrown still comes from that district, especially the varieties now known as Longbottom Leaf, Old Toby, and Southern Star. How Old Toby came by the plant is not recorded, for to his dying day he would not tell. He knew much about herbs, but he was no traveller. It is said that in his youth he went often to Bree, though he certainly never went further from the Shire than that. It is thus quite possible that he learned of this plant in Bree, where now, at any rate, it grows well on the south slopes of the hill. 
The Bree Hobbits claim to have been the first actual smokers of the pipeweed. They claim, of course, to have done everything before the people of the Shire, whom they referred to as colonists. But in this case their claim is, I think, likely to be true. And certainly it was from Bree that the art of smoking the genuine weed spread in the recent centuries among dwarves and such other folk, rangers, wizards or wanderers, as still passed to and fro through the ancient road meeting. The home and centre of the art is thus to be found in the old inn of Bree, the prancing pony that has been kept by the family of Butterbur from time beyond record. All the same, observations that I have made on my own many journeys south have convinced me that the weed itself is not native to our part of the world, but came northward from the lower Anduin, whither it was, I suspect, originally brought over sea by the men of Westerness. It grows abundantly in Gondor, and there is richer and larger than in the north, where it is never found wild, and flourishes only in warm, sheltered places like Longbottom. The men of Gondor call it sweet galenas, and esteem it only for the fragrance of its flowers. From that land it must have been carried up the greenway during the long centuries between the coming of Elendil and our own days. But even the Dúnedain of Gondor allow us this credit. Hobbits first put it into pipes. Not even the wizards first thought of that before we did. The one wizard that I knew took up the art long ago and became as skilful in it as in all other things that he put his mind to. 3. Of the Ordering of the Shah the shire was divided into four quarters, the farthings already referred to, north, south, east and west, and these again each into a number of folklands, which still bore the names of some of the old leading families, although by the time of this history these names were no longer found only in their proper folklands. Nearly all Tooks still lived in the Tookland, but that was not true of many other families, such as the Bagginses or the Boffins. Outside the Farthings were the East and West Marches, the Buckland, and the West March added to the Shire in Shire Reckoning 1462. The Shire at this time had hardly any government. Families, for the most part, managed their own affairs. Growing food and eating it occupied most of their time, in other matters they were, as a rule, generous and not greedy, but contented and moderate, so that estates, farms, workshops, and small trades tended to remain unchanged for generations. There remained, of course, the ancient tradition concerning the High King at Fornost, or Norbury, as they called it, away north of the Shire. But there had been no king for nearly a thousand years, and even the ruins of King's Norbury were covered with grass. Yet the hobbits still said of wild folk and wicked things, such as trolls, that they had not heard of the king, for they attributed to the king of old all their essential laws, and usually they kept the laws of free will, because they were the rules, as they said, both ancient and just. It is true that the Took family had long been pre-eminent, for the office of Thane had passed to them, from the old bucks, some centuries before, and the chief Took had borne that title ever since. The Thane was the master of the Shire Moot, and captain of the Shire Muster, and the Hobbitry in arms, but as Muster and Moot were only held in times of emergency, which no longer occurred, the Thane ship had ceased to be more than a nominal dignity. The Took family was still, indeed, accorded a special respect, for it remained both numerous and exceedingly wealthy, and was liable to produce in every generation strong characters of peculiar habits and even adventurous temperament. The latter qualities, however, were now rather tolerated in the rich than generally approved. The custom endured, nonetheless, of referring to the head of the family as the Took, and of adding to his name, if required, a number, 
such as Eisengrim II, for instance. The only real official in the Shire at this date was the Mayor of Mickle Delving, or of the Shire, who was elected every seven years at the Free Fair on the White Downs at the Lythe, that is at Midsummer. As Mayor, almost his only duty was to preside at banquets, given on the Shire holidays, which occurred at frequent intervals. But the offices of postmaster and first sheriff were attached to the mayoralty, so that he managed both the messenger service and the watch. These were the only shire services, and the messengers were the most numerous, and much the busier of the two. By no means all hobbits were lettered, but those who were wrote constantly to all their friends and a selection of their relations, who lived further off than an afternoon's walk. The sheriffs was the name that the hobbits gave to their police, or the nearest equivalent that they possessed. They had, of course, no uniforms, such things being quite unknown, only a feather in their caps, and they were in practice rather haywards than policemen, more concerned with the straying of beasts than of people. There were in all the shire only twelve of them, three in each farthing, for inside work. A rather larger body, varying at need, was employed to beat the bounds, and to see that outsiders of any kind, great or small, did not make themselves a nuisance. At the time when this story begins, the bounders, as they were called, had been greatly increased. There were many reports and complaints of strange persons and creatures prowling about the borders or over them. The first sign that all was not quite as it should be, and always had been, except in tales and legends of long ago. Few heeded the sign, and not even Bilbo yet had any notion of what it portended. Sixty years had passed since he set out on his memorable journey, and he was old even for hobbits, who reached a hundred as often as not. But much evidently still remained of the considerable wealth that he had brought back. How much or how little he revealed to no one, not even to Frodo, his favourite nephew, and he still kept secret the ring that he had found. 4. Of the Finding of the Ring As is told in The Hobbit, there came one day to Bilbo's door the great wizard Gandalf the Grey, and thirteen dwarves with him none other, indeed, than Thorin Oakenshield, descendant of kings, and his twelve companions in exile. With them he set out, to his own lasting astonishment, on a morning of April, it being then the year 1341, Shire Reckoning, on a quest of great treasure, the dwarf hordes of the kings under the mountain, beneath Erebor in Dale, far off in the east. The quest was successful, and the dragon that guarded the horde was destroyed. Yet, though before all was won, the battle of five armies was fought, and Thorin was slain, and many deeds of renown were done, the matter would scarcely have concerned later history, or earned more than a note in the long annals of the Third Age, but for an accident by the way. The party was assailed by orcs in a high pass of the misty mountains as they went towards Wilderland. And so it happened that Bilbo was lost for a while in the black orc mines deep under the mountains, and there, as he groped in vain in the dark, he put his hand on a ring, lying on the floor of a tunnel. He put it in his pocket. It seemed then like mere luck. Trying to find his way out, Bilbo went on down to the roots of the mountains, until he could go no further. At the bottom of the tunnel lay a cold lake far from the light, and on an island of rock in the water lived Gollum. He was a loathsome little creature. He paddled a small boat with his large flat feet, peering with pale luminous eyes and catching blind fish with long fingers and eating them raw. He ate any living thing, even orc, if he could catch it and strangle it without a struggle. He possessed a secret treasure that had come to him long ages ago when he lived still in the light a ring of gold that made its wearer invisible. It was the one thing he loved, his precious, and he talked to it, even when it was not with him. 
for he kept it hidden safe in a hole on his island, except when he was hunting or spying on the orcs of the mines. Maybe he would have attacked Bilbo at once, if the ring had been on him when they met, but it was not, and the hobbit held in his hand an elvish knife, which served him as a sword. So to gain time, Gollum challenged Bilbo to the riddle game, saying that if he asked a riddle which Bilbo could not guess, then he would kill him and eat him. But if Bilbo defeated him, then he would do as Bilbo wished. He would lead him to a way out of the tunnels. Since he was lost in the dark without hope, and could neither go on nor back, Bilbo accepted the challenge. And they asked one another many riddles. In the end, Bilbo won the game, more by luck, as it seemed, than by wits. For he was stumped at last for a riddle to ask, and cried out, as his hand came upon the ring he had picked up and forgotten, "'What have I got in my pocket?' This Gollum failed to answer, though he demanded three guesses. The authorities, it is true, differ whether this last question was a mere question and not a riddle, according to the strict rules of the game. But all agree that, after accepting it and trying to guess the answer, Gollum was bound by his promise. And Bilbo pressed him to keep his word, for the thought came to him that this slimy creature might prove false, even though such promises were held sacred, and of old all but the wickedest things feared to break them. But after ages alone in the dark, Gollum's heart was black, and treachery was in it. He slipped away, and returned to his island, of which Bilbo knew nothing, not far off in the dark water. There, he thought, lay his ring. He was hungry now, and angry, and once his precious was with him, he would not fear any weapon at all. But the ring was not on the island. He had lost it. It was gone. His screech sent a shiver down Bilbo's back, though he did not yet understand what had happened. But Gollum had at last leaped to a guess. Too late. "'What has it got in its pockets?' he cried. The light in his eyes was like a green flame as he sped back to murder the hobbit and recover his precious. Just in time Bilbo saw his peril, and he fled blindly up the passage away from the water, and once more he was saved by his luck. For as he ran he put his hand in his pocket, and the ring slipped quietly onto his finger. So it was that Gollum passed him without seeing him, and went on to guard the way out, lest the thief should escape. Warily Bilbo followed him, as he went along, cursing and talking to himself about his precious, from which talk at last even Bilbo guessed the truth, and hope came to him in the darkness. He himself had found the marvellous ring and a chance of escape from the orcs and from Gollum. At length they came to a halt before an unseen opening that led to the lower gates of the mines on the eastward side of the mountains. There Gollum crouched at bay, smelling and listening, and Bilbo was tempted to slay him with his sword, but pity stayed him, and though he kept the ring in which his only hope lay, he would not use it to help him kill the wretched creature at a disadvantage. In the end, gathering his courage, he leapt over Gollum in the dark, and fled away down the passage, pursued by his enemy's cries of hate and despair. Thief! Thief! Baggins! We hate it forever! Now it is a curious fact that this is not the story as Bilbo first told it to his companions. To them his account was that Gollum had promised to give him a present if he won the game. But when Gollum went to fetch it from his island, he found the treasure was gone, a magic ring which had been given to him long ago on his birthday. Bilbo guessed that this was the very ring that he had found, and as he had won the game, it was already his by right. But being in a tight place, he said nothing about it, and made Gollum show him the way out, as a reward instead of a present. This account Bilbo set down in his memoirs, and he seems never to have altered it himself, not even after the Council of Elrond. 
evidently it still appeared in the original red book, as it did in several of the copies and abstracts. But many copies contain the true account as an alternative, derived no doubt from notes by Frodo or Samwise, both of whom learned the truth, though they seem to have been unwilling to delete anything actually written by the old hobbit himself. Gandalf, however, disbelieved Bilbo's first story as soon as he heard it, and he continued to be very curious about the ring. Eventually he got the true tale out of Bilbo after much questioning, which for a while strained their friendship, but the wizard seemed to think the truth important. Though he did not say so to Bilbo, he also thought it important and disturbing to find that the good hobbit had not told the truth from the first, quite contrary to his habit. The idea of a present was not mere hobbit-like invention, all the same. It was suggested to Bilbo, as he confessed, by Gollum's talk that he overheard. For Gollum did, in fact, call the ring his birthday present many times. That also Gandalf thought strange and suspicious, but he did not discover the truth in this point for many more years, as will be seen in this book. Of Bilbo's later adventures, little more need be said here. With the help of the ring, he escaped from the orc guards at the gate and rejoined his companions. He used the ring many times on his quest, chiefly for the help of his friends, but he kept it secret from them as long as he could. After his return to his home, he never spoke of it again to anyone save Gandalf and Frodo, and no one else in the Shire knew of its existence, or so he believed. Only to Frodo did he show the account of his journey that he was writing. His sword, Sting, Bilbo hung over his fireplace, and his coat of marvellous mail, the gift of the dwarves from the dragon horde, he lent to a museum, to the mickle-delving Matham House, in fact. But he kept in a drawer at Bag End the old cloak and hood that he had worn on his travels, and the ring, secured by a fine chain, remained in his pocket. He returned to his home at Bag End on June the 22nd in his 52nd year, Shire Reckoning, 1342, and nothing very notable occurred in the Shire until Mr. Baggins began the preparations for the celebration of his 111th birthday, Shire Reckoning, 1401. At this point this history began. Note on the Shire Records At the end of the Third Age, the part played by the Hobbits in the great events that led to the inclusion of the Shire in the reunited kingdom awakened among them a more widespread interest in their own history. And many of their traditions, up to that time still mainly oral, were collected and written down. The greater families were also concerned with events in the kingdom at large, and many of their members studied its ancient histories and legends. By the end of the first century of the Fourth Age, there were already to be found in the Shire several libraries that contained many historical books and records. The largest of these collections were probably at Undertowers, at Great Smiles, and at Brandy Hall. This account of the end of the Third Age is drawn mainly from the Red Book of Westmarch. That most important source for the history of the War of the Ring was so called because it was long preserved at Undertowers, the home of the Fairbairns, Wardens of the West March. It was in origin Bilbo's private diary, which he took with him to Rivendell. Frodo brought it back to the Shire, together with many loose leaves of notes, and during Shire Reckoning 1420-21, he nearly filled its pages with his account of the war. But annexed to it, and preserved with it, probably in a single red case, were the three large volumes, bound in red leather, that Bilbo gave to him as a parting gift. To these four volumes there was added in Westmarch a fifth containing commentaries, genealogies, and various other matter concerning the Hobbit members of the Fellowship. The original red book has not been preserved, but many copies were made, especially of the first volume, for the use of the descendants of the children of Master Samwise. The most important copy, however, has a different history. 
It was kept at Great Smiles, but it was written in Gondor, probably at the request of the great-grandson of Peregrin, and completed in Shire Reckoning 1592. Its southern scribe appended this note. Findegil, King's writer, finished this work in 4172. It is an exact copy in all details of the Thane's book in Minas Tirith. That book was a copy made at the request of King Elessa of the Red Book of Pirianath, and was brought to him by the Thane Peregrine when he retired to Gondor in 464. The Thane's book was thus the first copy made of the Red Book, and contained much that was later omitted or lost. In Minas Tirith it received much annotation, and many corrections, especially of names, words, and quotations in the Elvish languages, and there was added to it an abbreviated version of those parts of the tale of Aragorn and Arwen which lie outside the account of the war. The full tale is stated to have been written by Barahir, grandson of the steward Faramir, some time after the passing of the king. But the chief importance of Findigel's copy is that it alone contains the whole of Bilbo's translations from the Elvish. These three volumes were found to be a work of great skill and learning in which, between 1403 and 1418, he had used all the sources available to him in Rivendell, both living and written. But since they were little used by Frodo, being almost entirely concerned with the elder days, no more is said of them here. Since Mary Ardoch and Peregrine became the heads of their great families, and at the same time kept up their connections with Rohan and Gondor, the libraries at Bucklebray and Tuckborough contained much that did not appear in the Red Book. In Brandy Hall there were many works dealing with Eriado and the history of Rohan. Some of these were composed or begun by Meriadoc himself, though in the Shah he was chiefly remembered for his Herb Lore of the Shah and for his Reckoning of Years, in which he discussed the relation of the calendars of the Shah and Brie to those of Rivendell, Gondor, and Rohan. He also wrote a short treatise on old words and names in the Shah, showing special interest in discovering the kinship with the language of the Rohirrim of such shire words as Matham and old elements in place names. At Great Smiles the books were of less interest to shire folk, though more important for larger history. None of them was written by Peregrine, but he and his successors collected many manuscripts written by scribes of Gondor mainly copies of summaries of histories or legends relating to Elendil and his heirs. Only here in the Shire were to be found extensive materials for the history of Númenor and the arising of Sauron. It was probably at great smiles that the tale of years was put together with the assistance of material collected by Meriadoc. Though the dates given are often conjectural, especially for the Second Age, they deserve attention. It is probable that Meriadoc obtained assistance and information from Rivendell, which he visited more than once. There, though Elrond had departed, his sons long remained, together with some of the high elven folk. It is said that Celeborn went to dwell there after the departure of Galadriel, but there is no record of the day when at last he sought the Grey Havens, and with him went the last living memory of the elder days in Middle-earth. The End This ends the author's note, marking the end of the recorded book's production of The Lord of the Rings Trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien, narrated in its entirety by Robert Inglis. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote an appendix to The Lord of the Rings entitled The Annals of the Kings and Rulers. This three-disc book chronicles in detail the Numenorean kings, the House of Ale, and Durin's Folk. The chief purpose of this appendix is to further illuminate the War of the Ring, and it alludes to the legends of the First Age, including the creation of the Silmarilli, the Three Jewels, and the founding of the Realm of Numenor. The Annals of the Kings and Rulers is primarily concerned with the Second and Third Ages, the war against Zauron, 
The establishment by Elendil of the Numenorium realms in exile, Arnor and Gondor, the taking of the One Ring by Isildur, the history of the stewards of Gondor, and the destruction of the One Ring, which marks the end of the Third Age. Tolkien also recounts the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, the third and final union of the Eldar and the Adain, and their reign in the Fourth Age, which restored the branches of the Half-Elven. The three-disc annals of the kings and rulers, also narrated by Robert Inglis, rounds out the saga of the rings and begins on the following disc. <laughs>